Okay, it's 20 minutes past. Uh, I think we can slowly start. Uh, welcome to the third parallel session uh, dedicated to BSM uh, physics. Uh, just a couple of quick instructions to all the speakers. Uh, you have all 15 minutes plus five for questions. Uh, I will give you a warning when about two minutes are left uh, and then tell you when your time is over, but let you finish and eat into the uh, question time if you're not uh, um, over the overtime. So um, our first uh, speaker for today is uh, Ben from uh, the University of Zurich. Uh, talking about uh, the flavor of for laptop works. So please take it away. Thank you. Um, so I'll talk about uh, lepto quarks today and how it addresses maybe some mysteries about um, flavor that we see. Uh, let me make this turn. Okay. So first, I want to start with a theoretical puzzle, which is probably one of the first things we all noticed when we looked at the standard model. Is we've got the same number of quarks as we have leptons and we can organize them in these three generations. Um, so is there some underlying symmetry here? Um, another theoretical puzzle is as we said, we've got three generations of, of identical partners, um, but they get different masses because of their interaction with the Higgs boson. So, uh, I can kind of just graphically show this. The Higgs boson gives less mass to first generation and more to the second, more to the third. Of course, different masses for each particle. Only the Higgs boson can tell the difference between the electron, the muon, and the tau. There's no other uh, coupling or, or any, any other difference between them. It's just the Higgs boson gives them different masses. But we don't know why. Um, we, we don't know of, of any mechanism that it can do this. So we actually just have put arbitrary Yukawa couplings in for each uh, fermion. But um, of course, as I said, these don't explain why or how. We need some kind of new physics that actually can tell the difference between an electron, a muon, and a tau, or between an up, a charm, and a top quark. So there's another mystery which is ex experimental and theoretical in this and so it takes both to, to see this, but there's a long-standing discrepancy of the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. And uh, so here we've got this, just, a, just a kind of a diagram, just representing that what we're talking about is the muon's interaction with essentially the, the vacuum, but um, as measured in, in terms of its, uh, its anomalous um, uh, uh, magnetic moment. So uh, now we know that there's a 4.2 sigma discrepancy, and this is based on some very uh, impressive progress, both experimentally um, at Fermilab and, and in the past Brookhaven, and, and also the theoretical community to, to create similar precision in, in theirs. So this is a big discrepancy. In terms of, of other um, discrepancies in particle physics, the most notable ones um, these days are what they call the flavor anomalies and beta decays. On the left, I show here, um, uh, on the top here, this is a discrepancy in uh, some angular distribution for a particular decay. This is actually a B sub S to phi mu mu decay. And this angular analysis shows a difference between the, the measured and the uh, standard model predictions of about 3.6 sigma. Um, this is uh, with muons. Uh, the lower one is um, coming from ratios of B decays um, to dehadrons with uh, taus or mu's. And we basically compare the ratio of taus to mu's, we see three sigma variation here. Um, on the upper right, this is again an angular distribution for um, B to K mu mu, another three sigma. And there's a few others that I kind of put here. So we've got kind of a lot of hints um, of, of, of different, uh, of cases of B decays into semi-leptonic decays um, into different flavor leptons that give us this, these anomalies. So could there be beyond standard model explanations for this? Um, uh, some of them, of course, we might need new heavy mediators, uh, to get these differences between electrons, muons, and taus uh, that we see, you want something that can um, violate lepton flavor universality. 
And uh, a lot of these, these in, in common, when you try to put it all together, start to point toward left-handed currents. So standard model like currents, but, um, uh, but, but new ones. So one, one way to get all of this together is with a lepto quark. And this is a favored explanation uh, of many of these anomalies we see. So what's a lepto quark? Well, lepto quark, uh, it's a particle. Um, it's a boson. It can be a scalar or vector that um, couples to a lepton and a quark. And so this lepto quark would decay into a lepton and a quark. And so it carries, uh, must carry lepton number, baryon number, and color. And it's defined by some coupling, lambda LQ, which we see here. And of course, we see that these things must have fractional charge because um, a lepton charge plus quark charge has to give us a, something in the units of thirds. So let's say we want to try to explain the flavor anomalies with lepto quarks. So one thing we do is I kind of mentioned this, we, we have this RK star measurement, which is a ratio of B to K mu mu over B to K EE. -E. And we see that this value is less than one. The standard model predicts one, we see something less than one. So this is the standard model diagram. Um, RD star on the other hand is a B to K to uh, D tau nu over D L nu. And this is a number, um, in the standard model, that should be 0.25, and we see a value bigger than that. And this is coming from these type of Feynman diagrams. So if we add lepto quarks in, we provide a new way to make this same final state. Um, we can make the same um, uh, mesons here, the same leptons in the, in the decay, but we've provided a new uh, method for doing this in these indirect searches. And one kind of Com combined explanation that tries to put all of, 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 of these anomalies together is, um, is what we call, what I would call here, something with a flavor structure like this, where you have a lepto quarks that couple most strongly to the third generation. So we see there's a strong coupling between um, say the tau and the B or the top and the neutrino. That's this one. And then everything else is kind of weaker, um, although we see some kind of cross-generational um, kind of leptoquarks here. And, and the reason we want this kind of third-generation leptoquark structure is because we want to explain why, for instance, taus uh, seem to have a preference. So I call this, say, the LQ3, meaning it's kind of a third-generation leptoquark model. And, and we see that you know, what do these negative signs mean that you would actually get a destructive interference that would decrease your muon rate that we see here? How, how, this is how we get muons less than electrons um, to get a value less than one. Um, so leptoquarks could also explain uh, this G minus two measurement. This is something that, you know, lets us do this um, uh, kind of in the middle here, this line becomes a quark after this uh, leptoquark is emitted. So, We've been talking about indirect searches with G minus two um, and um, flay, uh, B, B decays. Can we look for leptoquarks directly? So leptoquark production at the LHC, we can produce leptoquarks in pairs. And I've kind of shown Feynman diagrams for the case of third generation leptoquarks, which like to couple to, in this case, tau and a B. Um, we can also have uh, single production of leptoquarks here. So this is a uh, one lepto quark produced and this kind of non-resonant lepto quark um, uh, production. So this T channel. Now in the pair production, the production cross section is dominated just by the QCD coupling. Um, but in the single production and non-resonant production, we have these lambda terms, which is the, gives us the production uh, of, of lepto quark. So this is this coupling. So the positives here, we get large QCD production um, for pair production here. Um, uh, and we have some other positives. It's, it's resonant, resonant production. Um, it's model independent because it's basically coming from QCD. Single production, we get a cross section that is in, enhanced by lambda squared, but we're going to get um, a PDF suppression because we need a, a B here um, to produce this lepto quark. And then likewise, non-resonant production, we have two lambdas. So we have 
couple uh, cross section that goes like lambda to the fourth, but we have a, a two PDF uh, PDF suppression squared, let's say, because we need two Bs now to produce our, our tiles. So at CMS, we have a number of different leptoquark searches. Um, we search um, for first generation leptoquark, second, third, in both single leptoquark pair production and lepto. Um, single leptoquark production and pair leptoquark production. So I'll talk about um, a summary of these now. Um, the green, by the way, is highlighting things that have been done with the full um, run to data. So talking about first generation leptoquarks, so these are, um, we can look at like say the pair production of leptoquarks. And here we wanna look for electrons, um, uh, either one or two high PT electrons with or without missing energy. Uh, we need um, high momentum jets and there's no real, there's no flavor requirements. These can be any type of, of jet. So then what we do is we construct uh, leptoquark candidates out of these and try to minimize the mass difference when we have two candidates. And we can kind of look at different kinematics. So this is the mass of an electron plus a jet. So this is kind of our leptoquark mass. Um, you can see some signal models and dotted, dotted signal models for different masses compared to the background um, with data matching on top of this. And so we make this distribution, but we also make a few other distributions. So dilepton mass here, this is a sum of, of the different transverse energies of the objects. And we take all of these and kind of come up with an optimized um, thing. We basically what choose the optimal cut that gives us the best Punzi significance um, for each of these three variables as a function of leptoquark mass. So we pick, then we pick a threshold, say for 600 GeV, we pick these three different thresholds, and then we do a counting experiment. And basically, as a function of leptoquark mass, we produce this uh, distribution which gives us a way to uh, search for, for leptoquarks. I just point out that these are, each successive bin is, is, is like the, the, a subset of the previous one. So we have therefore correlated bins. With this, we can then make uh, limit plots. So as a function of leptoquark mass, we here basically look at a, a cross-section upper limit. Um, of course, it's multiplied by a branching ratio, which is assumed to be one in this case. And we see that we don't see any really significant excesses. And this is one particular theory, which we can um, ex exclude in this case up to a certain mass where, where the coupling, where the branching ratio is one. Um, so we can also look at different values of this branching ratio. Instead of choosing one, we can choose uh, uh, zero or 5.5. And this basically determines how the leptoquark decays into different um, into either electron in a quark or a neutrino in a quark. And therefore, as a function of, for if we look at the uh, electron plus quark channels where, where beta is e equal to one, we have the most sensitivity, of course, if beta equals one, when we look at this uh, EEJJ. And likewise, we have the most sensitivity um, uh, um, for, the, for the other case, we have more sensitivity down at um, beta equals zero when we allow the leptoquark to decay to a neutrino and an electron. Okay, so when we add these together, we get improved limits, especially in the intermediate values where beta could decay and where the leptoquark could decay into either electrons or neutrinos. So we you do the similar... Left. Sorry? You have two minutes left. Okay, thanks. Um, similarly, we do something, I won't kind of go into this more, but we do the same thing for second generation leptoquark, so muon plus jet. And now I want to go into third generation leptoquarks. And uh, here we see that uh, we, we basically, one of the, the most powerful analyses is taking a supersymmetric analysis search for top and bottom squarks, where you have Bs plus missing energy or tops plus missing energy. And we basically recast this into leptoquarks. So we say, okay, this, this bottom quark is like a leptoquark decaying to a B and a neutrino. Um, to do this, we come up with a kinematic variable, um, which we call MT2, which is it's a, a sum of, of transverse uh, vectors of the neutrino and the jet that we measure. And we kind of 
um, choose missing PT vectors uh, or kind of uh, uh, iterate over different missing PT vectors and come up with a certain quantity, um, which I won't go into here, but, but uh, I have references for this. Then it's a kind of a comprehensive search of all um, different numbers of jets, different numbers of B quarks. And we look at this MT2 variable and, um, and kind of do a combined uh, search for leptoquarks. And here we have, again, a leptoquark mass. Again, kind of we see in this 1.5 to 2 TeV GeV range for these different cross sections for different theories. Um, of course, I'm running out of time. So I want to talk a bit about the single leptoquark search. Um, here I'm talking about a leptoquark going to a B plus a tau. Um, I think I've hit my 15 minutes. So I'll, I'm, right now yep. I'm eating into my time, but um, uh, let me kind of finish up here. So uh, this is just some information about B identification, tau identification, and of course, taus can decay into quarks, leptons. Um, we have two taus in these events, so we want to consider cases where leptoquark, where taus are decaying into electrons, muons, or hydronic taus. And um, for each of these tau decay final states, we, recon we construct this variable st, which is the sum of transverse momentum of different um, objects. And we can compare this uh, between our, our signal, which has kind of peaks at high ST and our backgrounds, the peak at lower ST. In this case, what's interesting is as you look at leptoquark mass, because single production depends on the coupling, we see that we have limits in black here that, that improve over pair production, which gives us kind of a straight line here. So our single leptoquark production gives us better limits at high lambda couplings. Um, and, okay, so here I have another analysis which searches for third generation leptoquarks. Um, I don't wanna go through all the details of this because I'm cutting, running out of time. But the point is what we do is we consider leptoquarks decaying into either T nu, uh, tau B, T tau or, or B nu. So we consider a whole bunch, but it turns out they give us all the same final states. And single leptoquark production no matter how, if we can take, we consider these different cases and they also give us the same final state. Um, we also consider that the jets can be merged um, or resolved. Um, so we can kind of divide this up using sort of boosted methods to resolve our jets. And then we look at again, an ST distribution. Um, here's a couple examples of a boosted uh, case versus a resolved case uh, where where we can kind of compare our signal expectation to our, our data. And um, I won't go into this, but I wanna point out that the kinematics actually change um, uh, depending on uh, the coupling. So if you're interested in that, I can um, answer that in, in the last minute that I have. Um, so we can then look at limits in the leptoquark mass uh, for different, uh, as a function of the coupling. And we tend to do better in the vector cases than in the scalar cases um, in terms of, because the cross sections uh, and the kinematics are, are different. So uh, here's a summary of our results. Um, we have leptoquarks in the first generation, second generation, and third. And for different kinds of leptoquarks, scalar or vector with different uh, assumptions about the Yang-Mills um, coupling. Um, I wanted to show one last thing here, which is um, if you had an, a new force that at high mass changed the coupling to electrons and muons, then you could look at a ratio of as a, of, of the dilepton mass of muons over electrons as a function of mass, and you might see a deviation um, at some, some high mass. So we see a slight excess here um, in Z prime to EE, which causes this ratio to change. So this is kind of like a, a direct way of looking. So here's my summary. Um, I won't uh, go through it in detail, but I just wanna point out that if you look at all these different searches we have, we're excluding leptoquarks in the 1.5 to 2 TeV range, and we have several new results um, in, in the works. So we should, we should have a lot more to say in the next year. 
So sorry, I went a bit over, but I think I've got maybe one minute for questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let's see if there are questions. Maybe we have time for yeah one quick question. Please raise your hands if you want to ask one. I don't see any, maybe I'll ask a quick one. So you mentioned there are these kind of interesting T-channel topologies and uh, yeah. I didn't get whether you have any explicit search for these T-channels. Yeah, um, right. So uh, let me just find a good slide for this. Uh, sorry. But, uh, gotta, this always happens, right? I'm trying to, okay, here. So the T-channel search is here, this what we call non-resonant. And what's nice about this is um, it goes like lambda to the fourth. So if you have a, a high coupling you know, greater than one, this, this, can, this can be enhanced enough to overcome this PDF suppression. And you, you actually, this is kind of like, like doing an indirect search for non-resonant leptoquarks. So, um, Yes, we have in the works uh, at CMS, we have an analysis on T-channel leptoquarks um, that's in the approval process. Um, so, uh, you know, I hope we can report on this, uh, you know, in the next conference. Thank you very much. I think we now have to move on. So thanks again for this nice talk. Yep, thanks. Let me stop sharing. And the next speaker is Alberto from the Austrian Academy of Sciences, talking to us about uh, NLP searches in CMS. Okay, hello everybody. I hope you can see me and see the slides and the pointer. Yes. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Then I start. So, hello everybody. This is going to be a talk about dark matter and long-lived particle searches with CMS. So, long-lived particles or LLPs are predicted in many BSM physics scenarios in particular regions of the modern phase space. <clears throat> For example, they appear when there are particle decays mediated via heavy virtual mediators, or when the model features nearly mass degenerate states or small couplings. As a result, the searches need to be performed considering an extra parameter that is the lifetime zeta. Now, an LLP decays follows an exponential, which means that the signal could manifest itself in various subdetectors in unconventional ways. Experimentally, we treat the lifetime as a free parameter, and this leads that one can have a plethora of potential LLP experimental signatures. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on dark mediators. Now, this is because dark matter can be explored with LLP dark sector mediators in various regions of the modern phase space. For this, one needs uh, a dark sector that is feebly coupled to the standard model, and this is what makes the mediators LPs and the dark matter not to be accessible at the LHC. And this would explain why no signal has been observed in monovac searches. A widely used benchmark, benchmark model is Higgs uh, rare decays to LLPs, Higgs to XX. And in this case, X is a long-lived particle that can be spin one or spin zero. For the case of spin one, one typically talks about the pair production of dark photons. And in this model, the lifetime is controlled by the kinetic mix in epsilon. The signal rate is controlled by the mixing of the Higgs and a dark Higgs kappa. And this controls the branching ratio of the <laughs> Higgs to pairs of dark photons. And then experimentally, the signature depends on the branching ratio of the dark photons, its lifetime and the mass. Now, generally speak speaking, the long-lived particle properties, such as the charge, the K products, or the lifetime can lead to a plethora of potential experimental signatures. And in CMS, what we do is to have a dedicated search for each of these. And in most of the cases, these are very unconventional searches. Now, in this talk, I'm going to focus on recent results for LPs, focusing on dileptons or leptonic final states and hadronic final states. And in particular, I, I'm going to spend a bit more time on a, on a search that we're showing for the first time in lepton photon. This search is a generic search for long lived particles, is decaying to displaced diamines within and beyond the tracker. This analysis uses a, uh, <clears throat> a dedicated double muon trigger that relies only on muon system information alone. This search uses three exclusive dimion categories that are defined by two types of reconstructed muons. STA muons that rely on muon system information alone 
and PMS mions that further include tracker information. Now, these dimion categories complement each other in terms of LXY uh, coverage. When we go to the largest displacement, we have dimions made of pairs of STA mions in the mion system. And when we go to small LXY, these are dominated by TMS dimions in the tracker. And here in blue, we have a hybrid solution where exactly one of the mions is reconstructed in the tracker. Now we can associate STA mions to TMS mions, and this is a powerful handle to suppress prompt standard model backgrounds in categories that are based on STA mions. One of the key features of the search is the collinearity angle delta phi, and this is defined as the angle between the LXY and the dimion PT vector. This angle here is expected to be small for signal. We use less than pi over four signal region uh, applied to uh, dimions that are, that are opposite sign. Now for the backgrounds, we can have delta phi symmetric backgrounds. For example, this can be prompt neon pairs with a large apparent displacement. And this is because of the resolution pairs. Because these are prompt neons, we call this trillion-like, but we can study them in a control region with large collinearity. We can also have delta phi asymmetric uh, backgrounds. And this can be, for example, mismeasured neons producing non-prompt shape side to new mu. In this case, we use as control region, small collinearity and same sign dimensions. The backgrounds are evaluated using an ABCD method where we take the yields in these two control regions and we multiply them by transfer factors R that we evaluate in data in background and reached measurement regions. To explain a bit better how this works, let me introduce <clears throat> um, the signal regions in terms of displacement for each of the categories. For this, we place cuts on LXY and the XY significance. And let me also mention the main handles to suppress the background. For categories that rely on TMS mions, we use the isolation. And for categories that use STA mions, as I said, we can match STA mions to TMS mions to, to lead to them. Now we define, we can define measurement regions that are signal depleted by inverting each of these cuts. And this is what is shown here in this plot. So these are STA, STA dimions. These are signal-like, they pass the full analysis selection, but they have a matched TMS, TMS dimion. So in this case, we can evaluate the transfer factor. This corresponds to, to the Drillian measurement. And the typical values depend on the category, but they are close to unity for Drillian, and they vary between one to two for QCD, depending on the mass. Now, <clears throat> that we have the transfer factors, we can make background predictions and we can validate them in validation regions. So for this, we define validation regions inverting the displacement cuts. And this is what you see here, see here for TMS, TMS. So this plot is shown as a function of LXY significance in events that fail at the DXY significance cut. So you see that there is a good closure of the background prediction that gives us confidence that the method works. Finally, we can go to the signal region. We do this separately for each of the dimion categories, and we search for an excess in the dimion mass distribution. This plot here, here is for TMS, TMS. This one is for STA, STA. And you can see that the backgrounds are pretty low. This is done entirely in the tracker, and this is done in the mean system. And you can see that there, this is reflected in the difference in the number of beans, because this is done, this binning is done according to the mass resolution. Now, you can see that uh, in terms of displacement, the requirements are very different for each of the categories. And this is because the search is optimized in each tiny and category separately. This brings me to the results. And here, the results are interpreted in terms of X to pair of dark photons. And you see limits like this one you see here. So the results are shown as a function of the signal rate versus the lifetime. And you see different curves that correspond to each of the tiny categories. So at high displacement, you see in green here, STA dimions, while in red here at short lifetimes, you see TMS dimions. The final result is shown in black as the combination. And what this shows is that with this multi-category approach, you can cover many orders of magnitude in displacement, making the search powerful. 
The reach is usually quoted in terms of excluded branching ratio of heats of dark photons, and it ranges between 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 4, depending on the mass and the lifetime. And these are the best limits for all C tau, except for the typical tracker lifetime, where this search is complemented by scouting. If you go to the paper, you would see also another interpretation in terms of the kinetic mixing. Finally, I want to say that this search is sensitive to a broad class of signals. And if you go to the paper, there is a generic interpretation in terms of phi to xx for a wide range of masses and lifetime. And here I put a link to plenty of material for reinterpretation. Now let's move to scouting. And this search uses data collected by high rate triggers, storing exclusively information reconstructed at HLT in events passing double neon level one triggers. The signature here is at, le at least one displaced and neon par uh, pair reconstructed in the pixel tracker. It has to be displaced. And for this, there are cuts on DXY significance and DXY scale by the proper time. In order to reduce the backgrounds, there are tight cuts on the collinearity plus a veto on dimions uh, compatible with the detector material or pilot. And the idea here is to search for an arrow resonance in beams of LXY, dimion PT, and isolation. So as you go farther down in displacement, you want to search for a peak in this distribution. And for this, you are going to evaluate the background from a mass sideband window. The results of this search are interpreted of the, in terms of the production of Higgs to pair of dark photons like before. And this plot here is shown for a fixed lifetime as a function of the mass. For this search, I want to highlight the very low mass regime because this region of the phase space can be only explored with scouting. You also see <clears throat> some gray areas here, and they correspond to mass intervals near uh, standard model resonances, and these are not explored. Now, for this mass regime, the results also include another interpretation in terms of B to phi x, where B is B hydrogen decays. At high mass, the search is also powerful, especially for tracker life science, where this sensitivity is slightly better than the search that I just descri uh, described. And then finally, I put link to plenty of material for reinterpretation. The next search is a displaced, uh, a search for inclusive displaced leptons. And what makes this search unique is that there are no requirements on the lepton charges or the presence of a common vertex. In addition, it also includes displaced electrons. The signature is at least two isolated displaced leptons with moderate PT. This requirement depends on, on, on the trigger at a given year. The signal region is split by leptonic final state, and the search is done in beams of lepton PT and DXY starting at 100 microns. And the background is coming from leptonic tau decays and heavy flavor. There are various interpretations from long lived squares to long lived sleptons, but they also include one in terms of Higgs to pair of, of long lived particles. And this is what I have reproduced here. Now, these limits are not as powerful as for the dimions, but I want to stress them because they are important because these are the only ones that cover the dielectron final state. The next search is a search for hadronic showers in the muon and cap detector. So this is a completely different final state. And for this, we have to go several meters away to the muon detector. This is several meters in C and in the radius. And in this, in this volume here, in the, in, the, in the muon detector, so this defines the geometric acceptance of the search, we're going to look for a cluster of hits with large multiplicity. Now, to make, that this is, to, to make sure that this is signal-like, there are cluster ID requirements as well as timing. So this has to be on time with a bunch crossing. To reduce backgrounds, there is a veto on cluster match, match to jets or mere showers, and the search uses events triggered by a missing each trigger. In addition, the missing ET has to be aligned with the cluster. Now, the most discriminant variable is, is shown here that this is the heat multiplicity. And you can see that for signal, for example, in orange, this has very large values, while for background in blue, this has picks at small values. And the background is coming from long lived standard model hadrons producing pile up interactions. This is evaluated inverting the delta phi or the, or the number of hits cut, and it's evaluated using out of time pile up or events failing the cluster ID. The results are interpreted in various final states. Here, these are jets, these are hadronic taus for a wide range of masses. And you can see that the sensitivity does not really depend on the mass and the final state. Instead, the sensitivity is, tr is driven by the geometric acceptance and the trigger efficiency. And here, I want to highlight the, the, the right-hand side of the plot, 
of the plot, the high lifetime regime, because for 7, 15, and 40, above 6, 20, and 40 meters, these are the most stringent limits in hadronic, hadronic final states uh, by CMS. Now let's change gear and go to the left hand side of the plot. This is the low lifetime. You have about two minutes left. Great. I'm almost done. So uh, <clears throat> in the low lifetime regime, this, this the search that I just discussed is complemented by XO20003. That this is a search for pairs of long-lived uh, dark photons in association with the C. And the C is very important because this is used to trigger the event by requiring the presence of two isolated prom leptons compatible with the mass of the C. The presence of the leptons makes this a very clean environment, and this is used to tag at least two displaced jets using track level variables. Now, the way this works is that the previous search had sensitivity around the meter lifetime, and now we go to the left to the millimeter. And this is the result for this search. You can see that the minimum now is in millimeter. It's a completely different scale. And this shows that there is a good co complementarity in lifetime. And the problem with this approach is that one has the sensitivity is limited by the Higgs production rate. One has to compare the cross section of gluon gluon fusion to CH. This brings me to, to the wrap up for all the analysis that I discussed, going from the bottom to the top in terms of sensitivity. We have the scouting covering uh, dimension final states with the best sensitivity for tracker lifetimes followed by the inclusive dimension search that covers a wider range of lifetimes. This is a search with electrons with, with less constraints in terms of the branching ratio, followed by the hadronic showers, these are jets, and finally, uh, short lifetimes, the associated production with the C boson. Now, the areas for improvement in the future for leptonic final states are the high lifetime regime, especially for the electrons, while for hadronic final states, this is typically the low mass, low lifetime regime. This brings me to the summary. I want to stress uh, that LLPs appear in traditional BSM scenarios in various regions of the model phase space. And for this, CMS has an extensive search for program for LLPs targeting a wide range of lifetimes, masses, charges, and final states. And today I've discussed some examples focusing on dark mediators. Now here, I wanted to put a long-lived summary plot from CMS. And if you look closely, you would see many more searches that I, that I have not discussed. And this is because this is a very active field in continuous R&D. And CMS keeps pushing its exploration of uncharted BSM with novel ideas. And for this, now there is a hard work into developing dedicated triggers for RAN3 and also to develop new search techniques. And now we try to do this with an increased emphasis on model independence and providing more reinterpretation material. So just before finishing, I just wanted to say that at least in my opinion, there are very exciting times ahead in RAN3 and the future for long particle searches. Thank you very much uh, for this very, very nice talk. So we have some time for questions and I see Tanya has raised the hand. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you for this talk. I have a question on slide 16, uh, maybe slightly away from your topic. Um, yeah, so I mean, now here you have this dilepton, dijet, dib final state, right? If I see it correctly. Um, yes. Dilepton, dijet, dib. Uh, do you know whether there are also searches for this final state without uh, finite lifetime? What so do you mean? Would be the H H to die scalar scalars decaying to whatever. Yeah. You mean you mean going to the limit where the decay is Prompt. leads to missing ET? It's why would it be missing ET? I mean it's all visible, right? Maybe I don't I don't understand it. So what you mean without requiring finite lifetime? Yeah. You you mean that is prompt. Or yes. you mean that? Yes. Ah, 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 but this would be a uh, right. So this would be. Uh, I'm just wondering whether this has been. I really. Yeah, I was this, just this, lazy. this has been done. So this mm -hmm. would typically be done. Well, depending on the mass that you're targeting uh, for the for the S. But this would be done in the context of maybe. CX resonances. Yeah. 
Okay, but this, do you this know will, this whether... will be done in this context? This has no. been done for sure, depending yeah. on the mass. Okay. If you if you're more interested in some particular mass range, just drop me an email and I can point you to the reference. But definitely, yeah. this has been done. Okay, this would be interesting. I maybe I do it on MetaMost. Maybe other people are also interested. It's fine, fine. Yeah. Well. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Alberto? If not, I have a curiosity. So back to the first analysis you presented. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, um, if you comment, can comment on uh, the relevance of uh, non-collision and beam-induced backgrounds for, for this search. So are they relevant? And what did you do to make sure they don't uh, contaminate your selection? Right. Um, so these backgrounds, let me just think for beam induced backgrounds, typically these cuts would be the most dangerous for categories where we use muons reconstructed in, in the muon system. Right? So the categories with STI muons. So for, for these requirements, so these first they have to be muons without tracker counterpart. So if, if, if they can be matched to tracker counterpart, these are reduced. But then for the cases where this is not, so they make it to this category, there are further requirements, for example, on the timing on the STA muons. And I think this is a powerful cut to reject these cuts. Now, in principle, these backgrounds, uh, the, well, if you go to the paper, you see that at the end of the selection, there are very event surviving. So this background is not even present in the control regions. But if it was present, they would appear in, in this control region here. So this is a control region where the, uh, the collinearity is large, because in principle, for being in those backgrounds, I think this would not cluster at small collinearity. So we would see them there. But in this control region, there are no surviving events. Okay, thanks a lot. I don't see any other hands raised. So yeah, thanks again. And I think we can move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Sanjoy uh, from uh, IFIC and the University of Valencia. Yeah, hi. Hello. Yeah. Please go ahead and share your screen. Uh, is it not uh, full screen, right? It's not in full screen mode yet. Now? It is, yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, uh, one second. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I'll talk about uh, the scotogenic inverse seesaw mechanism and uh, some of its important phenomenology. So this talk is based on this following paper uh, in collaboration with Professor Jose Valle, Nicolas Rojas, and Rao Sivasta. Oops, I can't change my slides. Uh, Sorry. Uh, Perhaps it's enough to click on the window to remind the uh, uh, preview that you're looking at this now. Ah, now I can see it. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is the outline of my talk. Okay, so we know that uh, need to know are. So you are uh, seeing my slides, right? Changing, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So we know that uh, neutrinos are uh, massive from oscillations and dark matter exists from cosmology. So hence the standard model is incomplete and new physics is uh, required to account for uh, neutrino mass and dark matter. And we also know that uh, neutrino masses are at least order of 10 to the power six uh, smaller than the electron mass. So in principle, one can add uh, right-handed neutrinos to the standard model particle content and uh, generate uh, 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 light neutrino masses through Higgs mechanism, but the equal coupling will be very small. And uh, so this suggests that neutrino mass origin is uh, maybe different. 
and hence the many proposals such as seesaw models, uh, radiative models. But apparently, in these, in most of these models, there is no connection between dark matter and neutrino masses. But for example, in Scottish model, this model can actually address both these uh, questions, uh, neutrino mass and dark matter, in a very economical way. And here, what happens is that neutrino masses are actually seeded by this uh, dark sector. <clears throat> so let's <clears throat> briefly overview the uh, original Scottish model, which is uh, just the standard model extension with three singlet fermions N and one scalar doublet eta. Both are G2 odd. So this is the equal Lagrangian and this is the potential, but yeah, as uh, eta is G2 odd, it will not have any VEP and uh, uh, it will not have any vacuum expectation value. And so there will be no tree level need to know mass. Okay, so, and in inert scalar sector, you have two component, eta plus and eta zero. So these are their mass spectrums. And you see that the mass difference between eta R and eta I is actually <clears throat> proportional to this quantity lambda five, which, which plays a crucial role in it in a mass generation, as I will explain later here. Yeah. So this is the loop, one loop, which will generate the neutrino mass in this model. So here we see that only the G2 odd particles are running in the loop. So that's why I said neutrino masses are seeded by dark sector particles. And this is the loop function. And we see that if eta r and eta i mass are same, then this loop will vanish. And this eta r and eta i mass is, uh, uh, mass difference is determined by this quantity lambda phi. From this expression, you can clearly see that the, this uh, loop function is proportional to lambda phi. And as long as you take lambda phi very small, you can have large Euclid coupling, you can have Mn, A meter of order of TeV scale. And as uh, there is a G2 symmetry, so we'll have dark matter candidates here. We can either have fermionic or scalar. But in case of fermionic dark matter, the problem is that the Euclid coupling which plays the role in charged lepton flavor violations such as mu to E gamma, will play also a role in the, anil, let's say, in relic density uh, calculation. And so, uh, and there is a constraint, there are tight constant on this Euclid coupling from charged lepton flavor violation. So, fermionic dark matter is more restrictive in this model. But in scalar dark matter, as eta is coming from a doublet, it will have gauge interaction. So, there is no direct correlation between uh, sc scalar dark matter and lepton flavor violation here. Okay. So, okay, so before going into the scottogenic inverse CISO, let's uh, discuss a little bit about low scale CISO, which uh, is just, uh, you need to add a pair of singlet mu C and S, and this is the equal Lagrangian, and you see this term, which actually explicitly, mu SS term, which will explicitly be, break a lepton number by two units. And the neutrino mass will be actually proportional to this parameter mu S. And as long as you take mu s very small, you can successfully explain neutrino mass. And in addition to this, you can actually allow large equal coupling, even for TeV scale element. So you can easily produce them at the collider. But there is no explanation for this small uh, uh, mu s in this model. So let's try with the uh, dynamical breaking, whether we can explain this or not. So in dynamical breaking, you just add, add uh, one more complex scalar with lepton number minus two. So once you add this, you can write in, you can write the Euclid Lagrangian, which is a, a lepton number invariant. And once uh, sigma gets web, this uh, mu SS parameter will be again generated. And then in this case, mu S will be proportional to YS V sigma. And you can take uh, uh, small YS so that you will have ultimately small mu S here. And in addition to this, in these kinds of models, as the sigma <coughs> breaks the lepton number globally, so the, 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 this imaginary part of sigma will have uh, will correspond to the uh, to a physical myron. And uh, if this myron is in KV scale, let's say this can also play a role in warm uh, role, play a role as a warm dark matter candidate because it only decays to neutrinos with very tiny strain proportional to their mass. So this lifetime can be very large. Okay, 
Okay, now let's go to the spotogenic inverse ratio, but let's first uh, discuss the explicit version. So in addition to low scale particle content, here you need to add one more fermion F and one complex scalar zeta. Both are G2 odd, okay? So G2 will not have any FEB because, uh, uh, sorry, zeta will not have any FEB because it's uh, uh, odd under G2 symmetry. And this is the Yuka coupling equal Lagrangian, and this is the potential. And you see here, we added one uh, term, which actually softly breaks this E1 B minus L. Okay, as uh, zeta doesn't have any VF, the electric symmetry breaking will be uh, driven completely by, only by this phi. And uh, uh, we see that the mass difference between zeta R and zeta I is actually proportional to this soft, soft breaking term mu uh, zeta which again will play a role to generate uh, the loop level into the mass, okay? So as here, we don't have this mu SS term, we see that neutral fermion mass matrix, there is no mu term here, and that's why there will be no neutrino mass at treat level. So our goal here is to generate the neutrino mass uh, at loop level. So uh, in other words, to generate mu SS at loop level. So this is the loop, uh, which basically comes from these two terms, which will generate the mu SS term. And this is the uh, loop function. And again, we see that if m zeta r, without the soft term mu zeta, m zeta r will be same as m zeta i, then this loop will again vanish. okay? So once this mu is generated, then we'll have the neutrino mass. And here we see that the smallness of this mu parameter is actually related with this smallness of this soft, uh, soft breaking term mu zeta square and the loop suppression factor 16 pi square, okay? But this is still uh, not a pleasant solution as the potential explicitly breaks uh, B minus L. So that's why let's try to go to dynamical version. So, here, in addition to the previous particle content, we just add one complex scalar sigma, which is actually G2 even, okay? So this will have a wave, okay? So this is the equal Lagrangian, and this is the potential, and now we see everything is B minus L in red, okay? So <clears throat> again, uh, this uh, M zeta R and M zeta I mass difference, this you see is now proportional to lambda phi, this quantity lambda phi. So effectively, this lambda phi b sigma square now plays the role of mu, mu zeta as uh, of earlier case. And uh, this is the loop. This is uh, similar to the scottogenic loop, which will generate now this mu ss term. These are the terms which is responsible to generate this loop level uh, mu term. And we see here that, again, I mean, uh, we can simplify this uh, loop Factor, you can uh, take uh, y zeta and amf to be diagonal, and then you can easily factorize this as like this. And again, we see that this is proportional to lambda phi. Once mu is generated, then again, you will have the neutrino mass like this. So uh, in diag diagrammatic fashion, you can uh, draw the neutrino mass like this, where we see that everything is same as like low scale CISO, but the only difference is that now mu is generated in loop level, okay? Okay, so now let's talk about some phenomenology. So we will have two CP events clerk, standard model Higgs and heavy Higgs. And, and the, uh, the imaginary part of the sigma will correspond to a physical myron. And as you have a heavy Higgs, the, the coupling of standard model Higgs boson to all the standard model particles will be modified like this. And in presence of myron, you can have large invisible Higgs decay to a uh, uh, pair of myron. Okay? And in addition to this, so if you assume that the dark matter candidate, let's say zeta, uh, mass is less than mh by two, then this, these two channels will also contribute to the total invisible Higgs decay. But there are also constant from signal strength parameter and uh, invisible Higgs decay. For example, this is the present constant on the invisible Higgs decay, which comes from CMS. And uh, uh, there are also constant on the signal strength parameter but still there are some, uh, let's say, uncertainties in these uh, quantities. 
So from these two constant, actually, if you assume that only Higgs to JJ is present in your invisible Higgs decay width, uh, then you can constrain the, uh, sine, uh, the, the parameter space, sine theta V sigma like this. So this magenta region is excluded from invisible Higgs decay, and this uh, gray region is excluded from uh, signal strength parameter. But if this m zeta r is less than m, m h by two, then the other two channels will also contribute. So the so this exclusion region region will also depend on lambda phi other quartic couplings. So in uh, uh, case of uh, this heavy and light Higgs mixing zero, then this channel is not there. So in that case, you can actually constrain this lambda phi zeta like this from this invisible Higgs decay. And there are also constant from direct searches, but uh, we find that for uh, V sigma larger than <coughs> V uh, H, this constant is, uh, uh, I mean, the signal strength, the constant coming from signal strength parameter is always stronger. Okay, so now the dark matter phenomenology, here you can have harmonic dark matter or scalar dark matter. But in case of harmonic dark matter, this quantity y zeta zeta fs will determine the rate. So unlike this original scottogenic model, there uh, um, the fermionic duct matter was more restrictive because the same Yuka coupling which was playing role for flavor violation will also play, was playing also role for relic density. But here that is not the case. And again for scalar dark matter, this is like a complex scalar dark matter, which is not same as eta r, which was coming from doublet in original scottogenic model. So this is similar to complex dark matter. So here the advantage is that dark matter and lepton flavor violation source is completely different for both fermionic and scalar dark matter. You have a bit less than two minutes left. Uh, two minutes, okay. So these are the, uh, annihilation channels, which will contribute for the scalar dark matter. So the only difference from complex scalar dark matter is that you will have myron here also. So in final set, you can have myron. So <clears throat> for, to il illustrate the relic density and direct detection, I choose some benchmark points, which is consistent with collider. Uh, the uh, so, and it's very easy to uh, explain the behavior of this plot. For example, the first dip is coming from S channel uh, standard model Higgs exchange, and the second dip is coming when zeta mass is uh, more than, let's say, 80 or 90 GeV, when WW and ZZ channels are important. And this is coming from the heavy Higgs uh, 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 exchange. Okay. But uh, one should remember that there will be sizable annihilation to myron depending on the value of mixed quartic coupling for these kinds of uh, plots. So this is the direct detection uh, cross sections. Here, both heavy Higgs and the uh, standard model Higgs co will contribute and there will be a negative sign. So depending upon the parameter space, you can actually have completely, let's say, uh, complete destructive interference. So that direct detection can be very small in that case. And for the same benchmarks here, I show uh, the plots for direct detection. And we can see that uh, uh, at least uh, high dark matter uh, mass is still allowed from Xenon 1 ton limit. And this is just the compilation of relic density uh, and uh, direct detection and uh, invisible Higgs decay. So here I fix uh, some of the parameter and choose this lambda phi zeta to be free. And this is the plot. So we, along the cyan line, you can have correct relic. And uh, this uh, black region is excluded from genon quantum. And this is excluded from uh, the invisible X sticker. OK, so uh, I need one more minute. This is my last slide, OK? Yeah. OK. So uh, if you uh, uh, just uh, consider only two copies of new C, S, and F, then that means one of the lightest need, one of the uh, light neutrino will be uh, massless. And in that case, actually, there will be effectively only one Myrna phase that will play a role in neutrinoless double beta decay. Okay? So in that case, you can have a lower bound both for normal ordering and inverted order. Okay? So this is, but this is just the consequence of incomplete seesaw. So, 
this is also true in uh, type one CISO with just two copies of uh, light needle, okay? And the lepton flavor violation is same as low scale CISO because the source of lepton flavor violation is same as uh, low scale CISO. And you can clearly see that adjusting this mu parameter, you can have large uh, value of uh, uh, lepton flavor violation. Okay, so this is my summary. So SM uh, uh, lacks neutrino mass and dark matter. And the scotogenic model actually can explain both in a very economical way. And here we have studied one variant of scotogenic model in the framework of low scale CISO, where you can generate this mu parameter through uh, the loop. So you can explain the smallness of this mu. And uh, we have studied the scalar dark matter, which is different from the doublet eta of scotogenic dark matter, scotogenic model. And also the presence of myron actually modifies the Higgs invisible Higgs, uh, invisible Higgs decay. And in addition to this, the nature of dark matter is not exactly same as standard model extension of complex uh, scalar dark matter because of the presence of myron. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for this nice talk. Um, we have time for a question or maybe two. Uh, I see Tanya raised the hand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's more a comment. So can you go to your slide 12? <clears throat> Oops. Uh, Nothing happens. I am not able to go back. Um, okay. Uh, click again before going back. What? Click on the main, on the, yeah. Click on your slide. Oh, okay. Oh, oh oops. <laughs> okay. Mouse was somewhere yeah. else. Okay. Uh, it's just a comment. I think the, the newest constraint <clears throat> on the six to invisible is 11%. Yes. On the Atlas that, that I noticed today. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So maybe it would be uh, interesting to update your, your results yeah. and see how, okay. Thank how, you. how this impacts this. Okay. That's all. I actually have one more curiosity or question on this same slide. So I was looking at this figure and so I'm trying to understand what's the best way to go after these models. Is it really putting limits on the invisible branching ratio or is it this kind of fermionic signal strength? Mm. No, so yeah, the thing is that here, uh, as you will automatically have this myron in your model, you will have the uh, Higgs invisible decay. So you, 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 I mean, the only way to switch up the invisible Higgs decay here is to take this uh, mixing, let's say heavy and light, uh, sorry, standard model Higgs and heavy Higgs mixing to be zero. There, there are no other option to switch it up because the myron is massless, right? So that, that channel will be always there. Okay, thanks. I see Tanya raised the hand again. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm not a super expert on this model, but on similar models. So <clears throat> typically, as soon as you have this mixing uh, angle, extremely strong constraints come from uh, signal strength, right? which you always have. So this is something you have to take into account for the standard model like uh, scalar. <clears throat> and also by now, I think uh, direct searches uh, depending on where you are. But my memory is that at least uh, for sure from signal strength, you get uh, um, constraints on the sine theta on the order of 0 0.3 as of yes. now, I would say, yeah, so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is true, uh, yeah. that is true, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that is true even without the Myron. I mean, uh, th that is true, just uh, standard model extension with heavy hits, right? I mean, there- Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is why I said, I'm not a specialist in this model. <laughs> yeah. I know for the heavy uh, scalar and it looks very similar, so this- Yes, uh, very similar, just uh, apart from this uh, Higgs invisible decay to Myron. So that will modify your signal strength mm -hmm. parameter also. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks. I think we have to move on now. Yeah. And the next speaker is actually Tanya. Yeah. That will so I lowered us. my hand. Now I try to share the screen. Yes. Share. 
Okay, can you see it? Yes. And then I go to full screen mode. Is it full screen? It is. Okay, very good. So thank you. Sorry, I'm not turning on my camera uh, due to bandwidth <clears throat> problems. Okay, so uh, thanks for, for letting me uh, present this work here. So my topic is slightly different. Uh, I will talk about the 2HDMA and possible E plus E minus uh, signature. So away from uh, Hadron Collider, so to say. Okay, a very brief introduction. So we all know the Higgs or something which looks like the Higgs has been discovered in 2012. So one could say <clears throat> the last building block of the standard model has been discovered. What are the remaining questions? Um, there are many, of course. Why is the standard model the way it is? So you can search for underlying principles or symmetries. Try to find explanations for observations not described by the standard model, like dark matter, as we just heard, also flavor structure and so on. And you can also take uh, an ad hoc approach and just test which model still comply with experimental and theoretical precision. And for all of this, uh, I think the main test ground are really colliders. Okay. So now I talk about this 2HDMA. Uh, the setup is a 2x doublet model type 2 and a pseudo scalar, uh, additional pseudo scalar, a little a mixing with a big A, and a dark matter candidate, which is fermionic. <clears throat> the dark matter couples to this additional field in the gauge eigenstates. Yeah, so this little a serves as a portal to the dark sector. This is a model which has really been heavily investigated uh, uh, by the LHC experiments promoted by the LHC Dark Matter Working Group. I think we already saw some results from experimental searches on this uh, in, in the BSM session here. And uh, this is, uh, I'm just listing some of the original references prior uh, before this uh, recommendation here of the Dark Matter Working Group. So one question I wanted to answer is uh, whether uh, this is really interesting also at the plus and minus colliders. Okay, so what do you do? First here, a brief th theory slide just uh, for the people who are interested in this. This is a typical 2 x doublet model um, uh, potential. This is the additional potential which links this field P, which is the one which gives you the additional pseudo scalar. And then you have the coupling to the dark matter here. So you have a uh, basically two x doublet model uh, content plus the additional content in this model. So in blue, I label everything which is a normal two x doublet model, and then you have these uh, two additional particles here, a and and psi, and also the number of parameters, of course, increases. Uh, these are the parameters I used in my scan. So you have the masses of all involved particles, the VEF. Uh, here and then some additional parameters, direct couplings or mixings. And important here is that the sine theta is the mixing between the uh, pseudo scalars and the between gauge and mass eigenstates. Okay, so you see it's a long list of, of parameters. Then what you have to do is you have to think about constraints. So from the theory side, you have the boundedness of the potential from below, perturbativity of the couplings and perturbative unitarity. On the experimental side, of course, uh, the VEF and one of the two CP even neutral scalar masses serves as an input from uh, current measurements. You have electric precision constraints through the oblique parameters STU. You have B physics constraints, uh, B to XS gamma, B to mu mu and delta MS, oh, sorry. I was too quick. Uh, then uh, the width of the 125 GV candidate, uh, direct searches and the signal strength, which I implemented through Higgs bounds and, and Higgs signals. And um, upper limit, as I have a dark matter candidate, I impose an upper limit on the relic density and also bounds from direct detection. And in addition, of course, recasts or pseudo recasts from current uh, LHC searches for this model. So for all of this, I used, uh, apart from Higgs bounds, Higgs signals, my own codes, Fino, Zara, Metag, Meta, and Metgram. Okay. Now for the parameter ranges, the working group recommendation for this LHC dark matter working group uh, is given above um, in this field here. So uh, you see that they uh, impose equal masses in the heavy uh, scalar sector and then set some recommended values to the other uh, uh, parameters. So in the end, effectively, if you count the number of still free parameters, it's a 2D scan. 
in contrast, what I wanted to do then is really let everything float. So instead of these recommendations, I just let all parameters float and in the end kind of determine some scan ranges I was interested in. And this is really uh, basically determined by efficiency of the code. Yeah, So you don't want to run three days to get one viable point, which means that you somehow have to constrain the number, I, I mean, the ranges of your, of your scan parameters which led to the, the, the values given here. Okay. Then uh, some examples for constraints. I cannot give you all examples, but I think some of them are especially interesting. So the first one here is B physics uh, from B2 XS gamma, B2 mu mu and uh, delta ms. This is basically like a two x doublet model uh, type two. So the A doesn't play a large role here. Uh, and I will just talk about this plot here. So what you see is the charged mass on the y uh, x-axis and tangent better on the y-axis, a typical plot you see in many papers. What is important is that you have this contour here. The contour comes from B2 XS gamma, which I implemented as a fit, which I got directly from the authors from the most uh, recent theory calculation. And I think what is important now, independent of the two HGMA, is that you really have a lower bound of eternal GV for the charged mass. Yeah, so for type two to extrapolate model, you have some additional constraints here from uh, delta ms and bs to mu mu, which basically gives you a lower value of photon and better. Okay, so the red points are allowed. I, I hope it's clear from from the plot. Okay, um, yeah. Now the next example I wanted to show are uh, constraints from oblique parameters, <clears throat> which I implemented via Sphino. So these uh, constrain basically the mass difference in the heavy scalar sector or in the additional scalar sector here. So on the left hand side, for example, you see a, a plot on the mass difference between charged and CP uh, even and charged and CP odd uh, neutral scalars. Um, and you see again that out of a larger range, uh, uh, just points are allowed, which are more or less mass degenerate, yeah, up to 200 or 300 uh, GV mass difference. The right-hand side, uh, I plot here as an example, the mass difference between the two neutral scalars. So you see similar behavior. And as it's also interesting to see how this differs now from a pure 2 HDM, I plot the pure 2 HDM without this additional pseudo scalar mixture on the bottom. And you see really that these contours, which you have here are, are widened because of this, Sorry, I shouldn't do anything with the mouse. I'm sorry. Uh, I widened because of this additional admixture. Yeah, so it's something you expect, and in a sense, it's also proven here. But you still see that you do get uh, quite severe constraints on this mass difference. Then the next uh, thing you can ask yourself is, uh, OK, what about uh, direct searches? So first, via Higgs bonds and Higgs signals. And here, the most dominant constraint is really from signal strength. So this is also a typical plot cosine beta minus alpha and tangents beta. For cosine beta minus alpha equals zero, you're in the alignment limit. Yeah, So you decouple the additional sector, <clears throat> so to say. And uh, what you see here is uh, the green points are the points which are forbidden after Higgs bounds and Higgs signals. So bounds uh, tests direct searches and signals uh, 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 compares to the coupling strength. And you see that really mainly uh, this uh, signal strength uh, points are the ones which are uh, including, excluding scenarios. So the blue points are points which are forbidden only after direct searches. And um, yeah, I think it's relatively clear that really the dominant constraint here comes from signal strength measurement. Still, I listed the relevant BSM searches on the bottom for some of the blue points, which you can see here in this plane. Okay, then there are LHC searches which are directly targeting this model. I mean, I didn't do a complete recast for all of them because it's an infinite uh, project somehow, but I did a kind of pseudo, pseudo recast, I would say, <clears throat> for the searches which uh, I listed here. Uh, what is important is that basically the first three are the ones which are relevant. However, this is after I applied all other bounds. Yeah, just because this is the part of the scan which is computationally mostly uh, extensive, you have to run Metcalfe with cuts and so on. So it really takes quite some time uh, um, for if you want to include everything. So the six plus missing energy and dilepton and missing energy and also the third one are the ones which are uh, relevant. Everything else I found not relevant after uh, having 
imposed uh, the other constraints before. What is also important is that uh, because I let everything float, you do not have a clear two-dimensional distinction here in these, in these um, bounds, uh, in contrast to what you typically see in the publications, because there, effectively, the bounds are only two-dimensional parameter scans. Yeah, the searches. Okay, then uh, last example, dark matter constraints. Here on the left-hand side, you see the log of the dark matter relic density. Uh, and then as a function of the mass difference between the mediator and two times the dark matter mass, you see this kind of typical funnel behavior that for zero, you really get a large uh, annihilation cross-section translating to low relic density values. And the important thing here from this plot is that uh, really there's a, a, an upper bound on the mass difference between the mediator and two times the dark matter mass of around 300 GV. And if you're above this, it's impossible to get uh, below the measured relic density. Yeah? So you're overclosing the universe, and this uh, then means that you have to obey this, uh, this kind of mass hierarchy. Okay, so this was all the scan. Now, what about uh, signatures at the Ibas e minus colliders? I mean, a priori, you have the same signatures as in a standard to extrapolate model. New feature is really that you have a new scalar, this uh, which mixes uh, with the with the pseudo scalar of the two HTM part, which means that both of them can be decay invisibly. So a priori, uh, the interesting channels are, are the ones I list here. However, wherever you, the little h, which is the 125 GV candidate is involved, uh, this channel is heavily suppressed uh, due to the alignment uh, limit, which we have to obey. Yeah, this constraint on this cosine beta minus alpha. The mass ranges for this uh, are between 200 GV and 2 TV. Most promising because of this suppression by cosine beta minus alpha for the, the first two channels is really this h big a and h small a at 3 TV. Uh, cross sections are up to one femto one, and the dominant final states are TT bar, TT bar, or TT bar and missing energy. <clears throat> Here, a little bit in more detail, the branching ratios for HA final states. Uh, as a function of the mass sum of these two produced particles. And you see the red points, which are TT bar, TT bar, are really dominant in large regions uh, of parameter space. The black points are TT bar and missing energy, uh, are also relatively dominant. There are some other subleading channels, but this uh, really looks like the best, best uh, final state. Then you can convolute this on the right hand side uh, with the production cross sections. And you see that uh, looking at this HA alone in a factorized approach, you reach around uh, 0.4 femtobahn. Uh, and the color coding on the right hand side here is the TT bar, TT bar final state production cross section. Um, then I thought it's maybe nicer to plot it in a different way. So, in a sense, the left plot is the same points, but just plotted differently. So now on the x-axis, you have the TT bar, TT bar final state uh, production cross-section. And again, on the y-axis, TT bar and missing energy. What is important here is the color coding is the mass sum. What is important here is that uh, whenever you're in this upper triangle, you have a dominance of the TT bar and missing energy uh, production cross-section over TT bar, TT bar. So you already have some points here where this is the dominant channel. And then, of course, you also have to say, okay, but I cannot really pin down the big A in between, especially if I have missing energy. So, of course, I have to take uh, also this HA production into account if you do this. Now, I have to say with a word of caution, this is without interference, so just uh, production and decay factorized and then added up. Uh, this region actually widens and you also get to larger uh, cross sections. Yeah, So, you reach up to 0 0.7 uh, femtobahn. Yeah. Okay, so you can find regions where this TT bar and missing energy dominates. Then I defined a best point. The best point is this point, uh, best defined as large TT bar and missing energy, low TT bar, TT bar, final state. Um, it's just here, I mean, okay, I don't know how much you can learn from it. You can learn from it that uh, the scalars are relatively heavy, really around 600 uh, femtobahn or, or higher. You are okay in terms of uh, widths. Yeah? So you are not in a large uh, width over mass uh, regime. And uh, you have some contributions from both H big A and H small A uh, as, as given here. Okay. 
Uh, I'm already at my summary. Maybe I'm too fast. I don't know. We will see. So uh, the summary is that I, in this work, presented the first GAN of the 2HGMA that combines all bounds in a consistent way and lets all unknown parameters flow simultaneously. An important lesson, I think, also without this additional A is that if B physics is used as a strict bound, uh, all heavy scalar masses uh, have to be larger than 500 GeV. Yeah, I mean, this is something which unfortunately often is forgotten nowadays. You still see many proposals for 2HDM uh, type 2 scenarios with low scalar masses. It's impossible if you believe in B physics and electroweak precision. So, okay, just as a statement or take home message. Uh, there's a bound on this mass difference between the mediator and two times the dark matter mass from dark matter. Uh, for A plus A minus, you have new signatures for something plus missing energy, uh, new with respect to the 2x doublet model without the A. Uh, I presented here HA production at 3TV, and I pointed to regions and parameter space where this TT bar and missing energy is dominant, but of course, there's still a lot to be done, uh, detailed simulations, including background and so on. That's it. Thanks a lot, Tanya. Uh, I, I didn't give you the warning because I saw you were well aligned with, with the time. Okay. So, thanks a lot for this talk. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see if there are questions. Please raise your hands. So I don't see any, uh, but I have a couple. Um, maybe the first one is uh, about this TT plus MET signature. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you have shown that it's possible to find a regional phase space where this is uh, relevant or dominant mm -hmm. uh, in, in your scan. But, but then a uh, few slides before, uh, I, I think uh, the BB plus MET and TT plus MET searches uh, were yeah. in the list of the not useful ones. So I, I think this was, yeah, 0. 0.5. And you said only the top three were uh, relevant. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, this is, yeah. So, I mean, this is, uh, okay. So this is LHC, what I showed is uh, E plus E minus, right? So this is already the first uh, difference, so to say. And I mean, what I did here was not uh, exploring in full glory uh, potential discovery of the LHC, but really just taking the most up-to-date uh, searches and, and, um, and uh, looking at this uh, and after my, scan points had already passed many other bounds. Yeah, I really have to say this because otherwise it doesn't make sense. So for example, this tongue and spatter has to be larger than one. Uh, otherwise the TT bar, you don't have a problem, uh, but this is due to B physics and so on. So it's really an in, in interplay. So this has to be taken with a grain of salt in the sense that I have already implied a lot of bounds, right? And then uh, for the E plus E minus, it's also not a completely fair plot because this is without background, right? So uh, once you include the background, things uh, might look differently. What I can say is that the TT basically comes obviously from the big H, which has a fixed mass. So maybe one can make use of this here, uh, which I think is different in the TT plus missing energy. Uh, uh, I don't have the diagrams in my head right now, but if you look at them, you have also different uh, possibilities of producing this, I think, with some T-channel uh, emitting then, emitting then the, the, the um, mediator and so on. I have, I have to look it up, but the diagrams are different. So I think it's a different, due to E plus E minus, it's really a different thing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, this actually kind of covered all my follow-up questions. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I have to look it up. I mean, the diagrams I don't remember now on the top of my head for uh, for the LHC. But... Thanks a lot. Um, we still have time for maybe a question. So don't be shy. Raise your hands if you have anything you'd like to ask Tanya. but I don't see other questions coming up. So thanks a lot for this nice talk and this nice study. And I think we can move on to the last talk of this session by Anissa talking about astroparticle and BSM uh, uh, at uh, Microboon.
Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, so let me. Okay. So hi, um, uh, I will talk about something actually completely different since uh, I will talk about uh, neutrino physics and uh, what we can do in terms of astroparticles and the understand our models, um, things in uh, microboon. So uh, the microboon uh, detector is a neutrino detector. Uh, it's an 85 tons uh, liquid argon time projection chamber. So it's a volume of liquid argon placed in an electric field and neutrinos are other particles will interact in the liquid argon and create charged particles that will lead to ionization and scintillation along their propagation in the detector. So there are PMTs to read uh, the scintillation light and uh, ionization electrons will be uh, drifted by the electric fields towards our three uh, readout planes to collect uh, the charge. And we end up with a bubble chamber like images like this one, where you can uh, distinguish several things uh, like cosmic rays, an electromagnetic shower, proton exiting, and uh, the neutrino interaction vertex uh, here. So um, large pieces have uh, many advantages as detectors. They have uh, some special resolution and calorimetry and a powerful uh, particle identification. So my robot itself is located at Fermilab and it's designed to work uh, with uh, the booster neutrino beam, which is a beam coming from uh, eight JV protons. Um, and, uh, but uh, where microbone is located, it also has access to the new beam, which is um, higher energy beams since the neutrino came from uh, 120 GeV protons, and that is uh, eight degrees uh, of axis. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, microboon is located on the surface, so that means that it has, it records a lot of cosmic rays and uh, also has access to other types of neutrinos like uh, supernova neutrinos. So microboon has several physics goals. Uh, the main one, I would say, is uh, to address the mini boon low energy excess. So I'm going to give many details about this because uh, it's actually this topic of uh, Nick Kemp's talk that was given late yesterday. So I refer you to that talk if you want more details. But low energy excess is that a mini boon, an experiment that was also um, working uh, in the booster neutrino beam, um, recorded an excess of uh, electron-like uh, events that could be the sign of new physics. And so uh, microbone is designed to investigate this excess and try to find out its origin. But that's not the subject of this talk. Um, microbone is also performing neutrino cross-section measurements. And once again, not uh, what I'm gonna talk about. I refer you to Wen Xiang's talk yesterday if you want uh, more details about that. Microbone uh, also has several R&D studies going on uh, to improve uh, the liquid argon TPC technology. I will touch a little bit upon that. But I'll mainly focus on uh, what we can do in terms of astroparticle and exotic physics. And you will see that we can actually do a lot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the different signal sources that we can see in microbone. So first, uh, the supernova neutrinos. So we developed a continuous readout for supernova detection and also reconstruction at low energy. Then I'll see what we can do uh, with our neutrino beams. So I'll present the search for heavy neutral leptons and Higgs portal scalars. And I will also touch on a few of our ongoing searches, not everything, unfortunately. So like I said, uh, liquid argon TPCs can observe supernova neutrinos. Uh, however, uh, detecting a supernova burst uh, uh, requires continuous readout, and that means a lot and, and a lot of data generated, and uh, you have to accommodate this somehow. So Microboon developed a way to uh, reduce the data by uh, zero separation and the compression. 
And the question was, uh, do, we loss, do we lose anything uh, when we are doing this? Because if we are compressing the data, but losing half our events, it's not really a good deal. So uh, we evaluated the performance of this uh, dedicated uh, readout stream by looking at the reconstruction of initial electrons that are in the same uh, range of energy as what you would, uh, the low energy electrons you would expect from uh, supernova uh, neutrinos. And uh, the problem on the left is uh, actually the um, raw waveform that you can obtain from one of these initial electrons using this uh, dedicated stream. And here you compare it to the uh, usual uh, trigger stream and compare the shape of the energy distribution to see if there is a shape change, a rate change. And you see that everything is the same, so mean, meaning that we are uh, able to record our events correctly. So, so the stream is interesting because you can use it for uh, supernova neutrinos, of course, but you can actually uh, use it for other kinds of uh, physics that don't rely on uh, the neutrino beam that reach uh, microbe. There are still further work to be done on reconstruction and selection, which leads me to talk about the MEV scale reconstruction. So uh, supernova neutrinos will lead to interaction of um, around a few tenths of MEV. Uh, but the standard uh, reconstruction algorithms in microbone are designed for a higher uh, energy interactions. So it means that uh, we can sometimes miss some part of the deposited energy in the detector. And that's a problem because then it will impact your energy uh, resolution, for example. So what Microbun did is that we developed a um, new reconstruction uh, based on blips, so-called blips, of um, ionization uh, from low energy gammas or neutrons that are in the range of zero to five uh, MeV. And you can see here the effect it has on the reconstruction of for a simulation of uh, supernova events. And you can see that we get the different little blips from the excitation photons, as well as the main, main electron track. So this can be applied, of course, to uh, supernova neutrinos, but also uh, to things like uh, muon pi inspiration, or uh, beyond standard mobile uh, searches, like mini charged particles, that I will talk about a little bit uh, at the end of uh, the talk. So uh, let's move now to what we can do uh, with our beams. So, like I said, we have two beams, and I will present one search using each of these beams. So let's start with uh, the booster neutron beam, BNB. So we, are, we will talk about uh, heavy neutral leptons. So some extensions in the standard model to accommodate neutrino masses predict additional neutral leptons that manifest themselves uh, only through their mixing with the standard model neutrinos. And a range of masses, projection modes, and decay modes are possible. Uh, but for the first search of this kind, microbun. Um, focused on one uh, decay mode uh, from k and decays and one uh, uh, one projection mode sorry, from k and decays and one uh, decay mode from uh, to a mayon muon and the pion. So uh, the HNL is produced uh, in the beam and travels to the detector and uh, decays inside uh, microbin to muon and a pion. An interesting feature is that the channels will travel slower than the beam neutrinos. So a fraction of them will arrive after the neutrino beam spill. So what uh, we did is that we designed a late uh, window trigger that extends beyond the usual BNB uh, trigger window. And you can see that here in this late uh, region, uh, we virtually have no uh, neutrino uh, arriving, meaning that we um, eliminate the neutrino interaction background. So then we perform a BDT-based analysis, and here you have the BDT scores for uh, different uh, mass points. We considered 10 uh, HNL masses, and we defined the scenario region as being uh, the events with BDT scores above 95.95. So reminder, we consider one decay mode and one prediction mode. And uh, we observe no excess um, in this signal region. So we set limits on the matrix elements as a function of the initial mass. And so here, 
And this is only using a part of our data. Uh, and we are setting competitive limits. So obviously we are uh, going further with this search and uh, adding more data. We will also consider more prediction and decay modes, the full trigger window. Uh, and um, also uh, we, are looking, we are doing the same search with the new MIBIM. Actually the new search is going to be out very soon. Okay. So speaking of NUMI, uh, let's move on to uh, another search uh, for Higgs uh, bottle scalars uh, this time. So this time uh, we have a um, thermal extension with a uh, stack scalar that mixes with the Higgs. And it's interesting for us because it's a kind of similar phenomenology compared to HNLs because we are once again looking for KN decays and once again looking for the scalars that uh, decays in the detector. There are several ways to look for, for them. You could look for a KN decaying, KN decaying in flight with the scalar uh, following this path to the detector, but then you will de deal with a huge neutrino background. So what we did is we chose to consider uh, kaons that uh, actually arrive at the new beam dump and then uh, decay at rest there and the scalars produced will travel to the detector. So the signature is in the detector is an E plus and minus pair. Uh, and we look for this typical typo typology of uh, um, kink uh, decay with two objects with a large opening angle pointing backwards to the beam dump. We used once again ability-based analysis, and um, uh, I'm showing here an example of one variables of one of the variables we we used, and uh, which is you know, the angular distribution of the larger objects with respect uh, to the beamline, and um, this is one of the most important one, ones. And we see that uh, the simulation is well modeled with respect to the, to the data. And here I'm showing the BDT score uh, distribution with the BDT controls uh, highlighted. Uh, and we see that here the BDT distribution uh, is agreeing well with uh, the background only explanation. So we observed one event in the signal region, which is consistent with uh, the background. So we set limits on the mixing angle as a function of uh, the scalar mass that you can see here is uh, the microphone limit, which is uh, pretty competitive, especially um, when uh, we highlight that we are only using 10% of the new data dataset. So obviously we are looking uh, to improve this limit by adding more data and uh, to, uh, of course, uh, refine uh, this search. And again, there is more to come uh, about this uh, soon. Uh, but this uh, furthering this uh, these two search is not all, what the only things that are going uh, on uh, within Microboon uh, currently. There are actually a lot of different uh, DSM searches, and I unfortunately don't have time to talk about all of them. But um, I will highlight two that I find interesting. So the first one is about uh, milli charge particles. So particles with fractional electric charge and uh, that, that are potential uh, dark matter candidates. And what I find interesting in uh, these is that they can scatter off uh, atomic electrons and cause blips of ionization in liquid argon, uh, which is kind of a di direct application of uh, the MEV scale reconstruction that uh, we developed. So uh, I think that it is really interesting to see how we can put this uh, software development to use uh, for the mini charge particles. And um, my, the recently the Argonut uh, collaboration, which is uh, liquid argon TPC, but much smaller than microbon produced limits for uh, mini charge particles. And uh, microbon will also have a pretty good sensitivity. So we are, uh, looking forward to see uh, our performance in this uh, in this search. Another search is uh, about dark tridents, and um, this time we are looking for dark matter produced from meson decay in the beam. 
And then um, Bachmann would travel to the, to the detector, interact inside, and lead to plus and minus final states. And uh, this is interesting in itself, uh, but it's also interesting for us because if the E plus and minus pair is not resolved in the detectors and detector and appears on, as only one shower, it could be an explanation for the low energy excess thin value mini boom that I was telling you about uh, at the very beginning uh, of the talk. So, um, this is uh, what is currently going on uh, with uh, microwave in terms of uh, physics uh, beyond, beyond the standard model searches. Uh, we have a very, very wide uh, physics reach, and uh, we are also always trying to push it uh, even further with our R&D efforts. And uh, I'm looking here a few of our other recent, recent results. And what I also find interesting is I said that LEE is not the topic of this talk. But if you look here at the theory landscape of LEE explanation, you can see that we touched a lot of things on a lot of things uh, with the first uh, series of results. And I refer you again to uh, Nick's talk yesterday. But there are still some things that we can do. And mainly, uh, several of the, the models that we can still explore are leading to signatures that are very similar to some of the BN Central model searches of developed in this talk, meaning that we are tools we develop will definitely be put to good use. And I think that it also signals that there is a new uh, bien stable model era, starting with microbone with more models, more modes linked to the LE or not. And uh, I mean, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen uh, in microbone. Thank you very much. This was a very clear and very, very nice talk. So let's see if there are questions for Anissa. Otherwise, I can open with one, uh, which I'm afraid is very naive. But ca can you go back to slide 10, please? So I'm looking at the reach of these limits. And, and well, the, the one from Microboom, but also from T2K, et cetera, they have all these very sharp edges in terms of uh, HNL mass. So, why is that? Is that just the range that you scanned, or is there some acceptance reason that you cannot extend beyond? The... At some point, you are limited by uh, the the decays that you can see. So, for example, in microbone, the heaviest uh, uh, meson that you can have in the beam is the K plus. So, you will not have never see anything that goes beyond the mass that you can get from uh, the KM decays. So each experiment has its own uh, limit in terms of uh, what mass they can they can reach depending of, on what is the source of the. For example, if you, we have an, a higher energy beam like in NUMI, we can go to higher masses because we can see a decays of particles that are higher energy. I see. Thank you. Indeed, it was a naive question. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. So uh, let's see if there are other. Questions, otherwise I have one more. Okay, so let, maybe let's go to mine. So in your slide uh, 15, so you mentioned these milli charged particles, which I find very interesting. A and the fact that the, the, their kind of distinctive signature connects back to these blips uh, in, in the reconstruction. So do, do you foresee any specific um, re-optimization of the reconstruction to, to, to catch these? What kind of work do you expect to, to have to do to, to do The thing analysis? here is uh, you have to balance things because, because when you lower the threshold of the energy reconstruction, uh, you reconstruct more energy so you can see things that are lower energy, but then you also start to hit a point where you are reconstructing noise, basically. So uh, the question is how, how low can we go, and uh, in order to get all the energy, uh, all the energy that we need, without starting to be reconstructing only blips of noise. This is one problem, and the other problem is that, uh, as can be seen on the on the on the picture here, what we are looking for in the search are some blips that are aligned along the line. So you can ask for, ask for one, two, four blips. The question is that when you reconstruct a lot of uh, low energy events, you have a lot of blips everywhere in your image. And the question is, how do we uh, 
uh, clusters and how do we associate them in order to uh, distinguish what is coming from one particle interacting and what is coming from well everything else that is going on in the detector so there, there's really an effort here in both the reconstruction but also in the, the clustering of the different uh, events thank you very much very interesting and very challenging i think it is quite interesting so I think we have last one chance for an additional question. And uh, I don't see any hand raised. So thanks again for this very nice talk. And I think this concludes our session. Uh, you're all invited to go back to the plenary uh, sessions that we start at uh, 4 p.m. UK time. So thanks a lot, everyone, uh, both to the audience and the speakers. Bye-bye.